Hi, I'm Dario Cortez. Berkeley College believes that all citizens need to be informed about the important issues that affect our daily lives. That's why we're proud to support programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and the partners in public television. Join some of the top healthcare executives for a lesson in health education next on Caucus New Jersey. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Health First New Jersey, dedicated to providing affordable quality health care for the communities we serve. Wells Fargo and by Roche. Welcome to Caucus New Jersey. I'm Steve Adubato. Complex issues are facing the healthcare system today. Issues such as reimbursement, the impact of the economy, and a growing number of uninsured. Joining us here in the studio to talk about these and other related issues are our good friend Terrence Bird, president of Health First New Jersey, which helps New Jersey's uninsured attain affordable health insurance. Bill McDonald, president and CEO of St. Joseph's Healthcare System in Patterson, New Jersey. Gary Haran, president and CEO of Trinitas Health and Regional Medical Center serving the central New Jersey population. And finally, Kevin Slavin, president and CEO of East Orange General Hospital and chair of the Hospital Alliance of New Jersey. I want to thank you all for joining us. Listen, complex issues that we are dealing with here. Terry, we had this conversation a while back. What population are we talking about and how are they being underserved? Well, right now, today, the healthcare system is very fragmented. Uh, the underserved population is normally the low-income uh, seniors as well as the low-income Medicaid populations. Uh, what we've had in the past is lack of access in the communities that we serve. Uh, one of the things that we're trying to do at Health First is working with our hospital sponsors, uh, such as some of these gentlemen in the room today, right. to try to eliminate those barriers to health care to provide a quality level of health care for those individuals that are in the communities that we're working with. Let's break that down a little bit. How do you do that, Bill? How do you actually get in and do that? Well, what we're doing right now is expanding the network of providers, and Terry's right. If you take a look at the reimbursement levels to providers in the state of New Jersey for that at-risk population, it is really, we're like 48th out of 50 states. What do you mean providers? Uh, the hospitals, the doctors. So if you're not paying a fair rate for a physician, let's see, to see the patient, what ends up happening, the physician can't afford to see that patient. And then by not seeing the patient, the health of that population ends up getting worse. Mm -hmm. Then what ends up happening in the long run, they end up in one of our emergency rooms. And as an example, at St. Joe's, we've gone from 72,000 visits in the medical center's emergency room to just this last year, 130,000. Oh, seven, say that again, 72 to 100? Six years ago, we had 72,000 visits come into the emergency room. This last year, we have 130,000. What's the impact on quality of care? Because obviously, it stretches your resources on so many levels. Well, unfortunately, uh, for the patient, the quality of care has been deteriorating in the community. But we've been able to, as many of the hospitals, been able to expand our clinical services to take on more of that population. My charity care volume, and I'm the second largest provider of charity care in the state of New Jersey, next to UMD and J, the University Hospitals in Newark. Right. Um, We've gone up 24% in the last four years, 24% increase. Right. And that population that now is still not being covered, part of the strategy with Health First and some of the people that are trying to address that is to get those people covered mm -hmm. under insurance and get them to see their primary care Well, I'm going to complicate it even more because, Gary, we had a, at Trinitas, there was a retreat with board members and public policy makers and others that I happen to moderate, uh, full disclosure. and. One of the things that came up that struck me that really complicates this conversation is some of your colleagues were talking about undocumented citizens. Yes. Am I correct that the Federal Health Care Reform Initiative does not cover those who are not documented citizens? That's absolutely correct. Uh, what does that do to this whole equation? It, it, it just exasperates it. Uh, nor does the state charity care program cover undocumented citizens. So. In areas like ours, we have a large and describe number. describe your area. Uh, it's the city of Elizabeth, the fourth largest city in the state of New Jersey. It's right. a population of 125,000, plus we have the entire Eastern Union County of about 300,000. So it just grows and grows and grows. And they go to our emergency room. They're taken care of as, as anybody would be. 
but the amount of uh, undocumented is growing. So hold on, the care is no different, right? Kevin, the, the same is no thing. Different. So Gary, care no different all the way around? No, correct. Care no, no different. No different. Right. <clears throat> but how are you paying for that, Kevin? Becomes a challenge every day, you know, because we're safety. And describe it by the way. Describe your hospital. I'm sorry. I just want to make East sure Star everyone General knows. Star General is the last remaining independent community hospital in Essex County, one of the few left in the state, right. uh, serving an urban community. Uh, it's a, as I said, it's a challenge. As safety net hospitals, we have a mission to take care of the uninsured, uh, underprivileged, and by making it uh, positive for them, we tend to attract more of those patients than w some of the other hospitals. Have you seen? I mean, Bill was talking about some of the numbers of charity care. Patients, have you seen those numbers go up significantly? We've seen them double in the last five years, predominantly because of other hospital closures. There's been four hospitals that have closed in a circle around East Orange General Hospital. So each time one closed, we assumed more of a patient volume and a larger percentage of the uninsured. Carrie, where do you guys fit into this? I mean, you see this happening. When were you guys created, by the way? Uh, Health First New Jersey was created in 2007. Did you, did you have a sense that this was going to happen four or five years later? Uh, yes, we, we could see it coming because it was also something that, you know, in New York, we st originally started in New York. <clears throat> so um, New York was where the company was started in the, in the mid-90s, so we saw it in New York, and also it just started here in New Jersey. Uh, managed Care came into New Jersey for Medicaid, New Jersey Family Care around the mid-90s. So we could see this evolving. And, you know, one of the challenges, as Bill and, and also the, the other hospital CEOs mentioned, is the fact that the reimbursement level in New Jersey is so low. And Break that down. Break that down. <clears throat> well, we're contra- what, it, what is it and what is it sure. for and what happens? Like, load a question. Sure. Reimbursement for what? Well, we have to provide services for these members. We have to provide a quality level of services. Uh, those services are provided through the community physicians, specialists, as well as the hospitals. We are, in turn, contracted with um, the state of New Jersey, and we're also contracted with CMS for the Medicare project. CMS is the federal? Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Got it. Okay. And uh, we are paid a rate based on the members that we bring in our program. They're normally adjusted for acuity levels, meaning if someone comes to your program and they have a higher degree of uh, illness, we should be paid a higher capitation rate. In turn, we have to take the money that we are paid and then reimburse the hospitals as well as the physicians in the community. Uh, New Jersey Medicaid notoriously has been low. We're probably paying about 37% of Medicare for the Medicaid population. A lot of the uh, physicians in the community really can't afford to treat those members at that level. So what happens? Well, we develop partnerships with the hospitals as well as with the uh, physicians because the mission is to serve this population. Right. And, you know, a lot of the uh, providers in the community feel that it's a necessity to serve this population. So we work with them to provide this quality level of care and to make sure the care is not fragmented so they're going to the uh, locations where the care is being delivered. So instead of having someone show up in the ER, as Bill mentioned, which is most costly, we try to channel them through a primary network and then if there's any illnesses, they will then be referred to a uh, but, specialist. But here's the thing, in spite <coughs> of all the programs, in spite of all the efforts, is it fair to say that New Jersey, as a place to be a primary care physician, is extremely tough, number one? And number two, if in fact there is this shortage in primary care physicians that everyone talks about it, in spite of everything that Terry just laid out, without the right number or a sufficient number of primary care physicians, how the heck, if you don't have enough doctors to deal with the population? <laughs> They, they end up back in our emergency room. Right, which Terry was saying we have fewer because of it, but then you go back with not enough primary care. Sure. <clears throat> right now, the, the study that was completed a couple of years ago by the Council of Teaching Hospitals showed New Jersey's going to be short. Is that Richard Goldstein's operation? Richard Goldstein's right. operation, where all the teaching hospitals are members. We spent a year and a half analysis with a whole bunch of different folks. Right. And we will be short in the state of New Jersey 2,800 physicians. 20, what does that break that down? Well, at 1,600 additional primary care physicians are needed and another 16 to 1,700, 1,800 for specialty. And what's happening in New Jersey, the young students that are graduating medical schools and their residency programs right now, and last year the survey, and we survey every resident leaving as to where they're going to practice. 70% of the physicians said they're leaving the state of New Jersey. Time out. 70% 70 of, of the graduating. Future physicians educated at public institutions, medical schools in New Jersey, 
supported by public tax dollars in the state of New Jersey, 70% leave New Jersey. Correct. Number one, reimbursement. They can't afford to see a patient because the reimbursement is so low. What, break it down. Uh, dollars worth of care. I know it's a ridiculous way to do it. Dollars worth of care. What do you get back? Well, they, let, let me give you an example. Sure. A cardiologist saw three patients, one of my cardiologists, did three consults while patients were in the hospital. He got a check back from one of the Medicaid managed care plans of six dollars. Two dollars a consultation. That's ridiculous. They can't afford. Now, the reason Health First is structured the way it is with the hospitals being partners is we're trying to reimburse those physicians reasonable rates, the hospitals, and where we're trying to make the dollars out of this is to try to take care of the health of that patient, as Terry said, to get them to a primary care doctor, not an emergency room, because okay, it's so much more expensive. Okay, go stay on this physician thing. How are you trying to, forget about attract, I'm thinking about retain, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, because one of the things is going into primary care, and many more physicians obviously are going into other fields. We did a program, could not believe the number of people going into cosmetic surgery and other yeah. related fields, right, for, yeah. for listen, a lot of it's economics. economics. Okay. At Trinitas, how are you retaining and then keeping primary care physicians? Well, we're, we're partnering with our physicians, our primary care doctors. We are uh, bringing them into the fold. We are hiring physicians as employees. By the way, let's make it clear. Primary care physicians are really important because in many ways they're gatekeepers. You can't see a specialist in many cases until you see a primary yes. care physician. Is that a fair? No, not, Terry's shaking. It, his, I can't. It's not. It's not, not as. as well, but they're but they're important. Right. right. Oh, they are. So, right. they're, they're 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 the first, if you will, the right. first line of defense in health management with that patient. Okay, they may not be the gatekeeper, as I said, but mm -hmm. they're the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Gary. So we are partnering with the physicians. We're hiring physicians. Uh, we're, we're seeing more and more physicians want to become employees of hospitals because number one, quality of life. They don't want to have the expenses of an office or malpractice and they want some semblance of order in, in, their, in their life. So I'm going to understand, one of the things we did talk about in that retreat is hiring. It's interesting, the question of hiring physicians to be full-time staff is, is something that is somewhat of a new phenomenon, Kevin. Is that right? Because a lot of physicians are like, you have your own practice, but I'm affiliated with East Orange or whomever, or a couple different hospitals. But a lot of them are saying, wait a minute, I can't afford to keep this practice going. I want a staff position. Right. But it, do those economics work out for you? Not, not in a small community hospital. A larger teaching hospital is a pretty much a traditional model. You had a lot of employed physicians, but in a smaller community hospital, actually 10, 15 years ago, there was a wave of hospitals acquiring physician practices for different reasons. That's coming back again because the physicians are seeking security in, in, in this current economy and, and with healthcare reform. And a lot of hospitals are, as Gary said, acquiring practices, employing doctors. Let's go back to New Jersey Family Care. There's an initiative. We had uh, Senator Joe Vitale, um, who was currently the chair of the Senate Health Committee. The previous chair of that committee, Senator Weinberg, was talking about the same issue, and it's New Jersey Family Care. What is it, and why is it important to this discussion? A program called New Jersey Family Care. Terry? Well, New Jersey Family Care is important to um, the constituents of New Jersey because it offers a uh, health coverage, comprehensive For health. Um, those individuals that quite mostly the individuals that are in New Jersey family care right now are children, moms and kids, but it also offers um, coverage for those individuals that are at 133% of the federal poverty level. That's equated to a little over $20,000 in annualized income. It's not uh, a lot. It's not a lot, and it used to be higher, but it was restricted uh, and, and brought back to the 133%. So it provides health care to these individuals who in the past had barriers to health care, meaning that they didn't have the providers in their community and their health care delivery system was normally through the emergency room. Right. Really is not the place to have uh, your primary care you know, services performed. So we now, they are now enrolled in a managed care plan similar to uh, Health First. Um, there's a 98% penetration level in the state of New Jersey. About what does that mean? It's one point, it's 98% of the members that are eligible for this program are now enrolled with one of the four plans. So that's about 1.2 uh, million uh, members are enrolled in these plans. So what we do is if someone has complex medical needs, first of all, we can do a uh, care management assessment to really provide them with the services that they need to try, help them try to navigate through th this healthcare delivery system. 
uh, right down. A lot of times they would go to the ER. Really, it's not the place where Bill or any of the other hospital C's uh, would like them to show you up. You keep saying that. Why don't we want patients being treated in the emergency room? You've said several times right. that's not the way to go. Well, Why be not? Because it's episodic care. There's really no way of really managing a patient if it's episodic and they're showing up at, you know, Kevin's uh, ER one week and Bill's the next week. We can't really manage this individual. We put them into a setting whereby they go through the primary system. There's wellness visits. If someone is a right. diabetic, I mean, to make sure that we manage. That'll you know, keep costs down, too. That'll keep costs down. It's very expensive. Right. The emergency it's room visit, very expensive. Just because someone's to say, I can go to the emergency room, listen, you know, in the end, it's my uh, option of last resort. You right. can do it, right. but it doesn't really make sense, right, Bill? No, it's not the best care either, because the emergency room is geared to taking care of an emergency, by definition. It's not the one that comes in, I've got a cold, I've had it for three days, you know, it's because I didn't take my medications, or somebody that's a diabetic that hasn't been maintaining their insulins, or somebody that stopped taking their medications of high blood mm -hmm. pressure. So without that monitoring, and that's where the system is, is trying to attract those patients into that, is to be able to manage their health. Not their care, their health. Right. And get them to the right provider at the right time. It'll be a lot less costly in the future, but right now, because the system's so fragmented, it doesn't work. Jump back in, Kevin, because I, I want to ask you, but you told our producers, Gary, there were some real downsides to the national health care reform yeah. effort as it relates to this discussion. I want to come back to that. Yeah, jump that's in. what I was going to jump into, go is ahead. that, you know, family care is great. Terry's Health First program is wonderful. We support that. But to go back to the physician supply element, if there's not enough physicians, particularly primary care physicians, it doesn't work. People right. will still come to the emergency room. That's what they found out in, in Massachusetts under what they call Romney Care is that they had great success in enrolling people in health insurance, self-insured, but there wasn't enough primary care physicians in Massachusetts to take care of them. Can you understand why a person who's talented and wants to go into the medical field, can you understand, Gary, why he or she would say, I'd love to go into primary care, but the economics don't make sense. Um, I'm concerned about national health care reform and what it would mean to me, and I don't want the headaches. Could you understand that? Absolutely, and that's, that's a big fear we all have. We're going to lose the best and the brightest to other industries who could have gone into How medicine. do we incentivize them? Well, I, I think they have to get the grants that are for, for medical school. There has to be graduate medical education funding for hospitals to be able to provide the training for the doctors, and that is drying up. It's, it's being reduced, and that's a problem. Uh, so it's a lot of, by the way, you go to graduate school, you go to graduate school, you go to medical school, you're talking about huge bills as you get out, right? Huge. Oh, so hundreds you got of thousands of dollars. Hundreds of thousands That's of right. dollars. So those grants, those loans are Absolutely. key. But with the understanding that you would be a primary care physician based. In your community. In your community. Yeah, correct. On average, who makes between one hundred fifty and $160,000 a year. Is that right? That would be an average throughout the state for, for a busy family physician. And then the, yeah. th the thing that is so crazy right now, what's going on in Washington, right now, effective next year, they're talking about reducing rates to physicians by 27 percent. Come on, come on, back this up again. <coughs> yeah. The, 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 Through the, the national health care reform effort. That is correct. Uh, the, the fact that the uh, committee that, that was supposed to have everything done by what, uh, Thanksgiving? Oh, the super, super committee? The super committee. Yeah, right. Automatically. I don't know if super is the appropriate well, adjective super, to use Super for, something okay. is probably yeah, appropriate. Go ahead. Uh, that didn't happen. That didn't okay, happen. we're past yeah. that already, so go but ahead. Right now, the reimbursement rates for doctors are going to be reduced 27%. Think about taking 30% of your income and it goes away. You're going to have the same kind of crisis going on again. The hospitals are the same way. Talk, Gary talked about graduate medical education. They're talking about reducing graduate medical education right now to support the teaching programs at a time we need more physicians. This, this is all about the management of the dollar and not really taking a look at an overall solution. Do policymakers, listen, yeah. I imagine someone watching this program is saying to themselves, wait a minute, it sounds like it's getting worse. And it sounds like the so-called solutions being put out there are clearly not helping and may in fact exacerbate the situation. Gary, do you get a sense, because you talk to legislators, you talk to policymakers, all of you do, all the time. Do you get a sense that on the state and or the federal level, there's a tremendous sense of urgency? Hey, we really have to deal with this because these guys are living with it every day and they know best. Let's make it a top priority. Are you sensing it? I have a sense that they're trying to make it a top priority, but I think they're misdirected in the direction that they're going. 
Uh, the, the physician component is so key, and it's one that's been left out of the equation all along. The undocumented has been left out of the equation Not all along. Not even there at all. Not even there. And th these people still got to be taken care of. Okay, and by the way, the medical, I'm going to come back to Terrence in a second. At East Orange, I know that one of your initiatives, I went on a tour one time with you, and one of the big areas um, has to do with, you actually created a separate facility to deal with patients who deal with mental health issues, right? Right. Talk Homeless, about that. Homeless mentally ill. And that's something we're all doing, all the safety net hospitals, is trying to find creative ways to kind of reduce the demand for the services. We found that in our mental health programs, because of the poor housing in the community, we were getting a high number of readmissions. They're coming back into our crisis unit what do you do or inpatient them? unit. We were able to access some outside dollars and uh, renovate a facility for 24 units of supportive housing so we can get them stabilized, a stable place to live, and it helped to reduce the readmission rate. Terrence, one of the things that you told our producers, and I know you and I have talked about this off the air as well, um, you're extremely concerned about the language barriers. And in yes. the populations that you serve, disproportionately urban, right, and you've got huge um, language issues in every one of your communities. You're in Patterson, where our other studio is, right, right? right. East Orange, mm -hmm. and in the Elizabeth area. How do language issues exacerbate the problems we're talking about? Well, language uh, really exacerbates the problem because of the fact that, you know, different cultures, you have to be uh, sensitive to various cultures. And one of the things that we uh, do at Health First is we make sure that the delivery of those services are delivered by individuals who are from the community, first of all. And also, it, it also limits uh, sometimes the basic maybe understanding of the program and what it's there to do and what's its intent. So to move away from, you know, the concern, the fear of, uh, we talk about undocumented. Well, some of the undocumented wouldn't enroll their children in the program because of some concerns about uh, them being, you know, uh, you know pulled, into, pulled the into the system and all those other things. So, I mean, language barriers are, are there. We're trying to break those down. On and you've got on cultural, the, right. which are not exactly right. the same as language, right. but you deal with that. How do you deal yeah, with we that deal, as well? I mean, we, we have, for instance, a primary care physician that's treating a certain population, say, in Union County, and certain services that are performed in a primary care physician's offices uh, could, say, for the uh, commercial population, would be performed in a specialty office. But because you bring them into that office and these providers have been providing these services for years, so we have to understand that as a health plan that we can't be as rigid as we might would like to be to try to move those services outside of that office. And we had that recently uh, in a couple of offices in Union County where, you know, there were some limitations on some of the services that these product providers could provide. Complex stuff, minute and a half left. How optimistic are you that a conversation like this well, let me put it this way. Given all the problems we've laid out, what are the reasons for being optimistic? I can't think of many. Um, as okay. I, as, as I, well, but you I, have no choice. Well, <laughs> right? you know, uh, the, the system has to restructure itself. And But I think what it's going to take is almost a crisis of the provider side to accomplish that. And we've talked about this all, and I, I had a conversation with one of our congressmen who really tries to support the health care in this particular area. And, and we were talking, I said, if the, if the rate reductions come through to the level that they are, I took out my car keys and I gave it to him. I said, you've got my hospital. We cannot survive to be a teaching hospital to provide the level of charity care that we provide any longer if this things happen next year as planned. And that will be true for many of us in this room and many of the big teaching hospitals in the inner city uh, around the, New Jersey and this country. Before we get out here, Gary, you feel the same way? Uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, I'm more optimistic because the uh, amount of cuts and the amount of change they want to put into place is insane. And I do think the reasonable man theory will come into effect and they're going to back away because hospitals will close by the dozens throughout the country if these programs are put into place. You're pretty oh, 10 seconds left. You, you were pretty confident there would be massive closures. If, if the cuts go through as being projected. I promise you this, this will not be the last discussion we have on this topic, particularly with people like yourselves offering this insight. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank, Thank you. you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 20 years of broadcast excellence. And 13 for WNET, NJTV, and WHYY. 
Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by Health First New Jersey, dedicated to providing affordable quality health care for the communities we serve. Wells Fargo, and by Roche. Promotional support provided by NJ Biz, All Business, All New Jersey, and The Star Ledger and NJ.com, Everything Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. The numbers tell the story. PSEG has a positive impact on New Jersey. Every year, hundreds of millions of dollars are paid to 9,100 PSEG employees who live, work, and spend their money in New Jersey. PSEG pays $157 million in retirement and survivor benefits to New Jerseyans, too. And PSEG pays about $375 million a year in New Jersey and local taxes. About 86,000 PSEG shareholders in New Jersey receive over $100 million in PSEG dividends. And PSEG spent $1 billion on New Jersey businesses, keeping it local. And our biggest impact for over 100 years, delivering electricity and natural gas safely and reliably to over 2.5 million New Jerseyans, day in and day out. This is One on One. I'm a poor boy, Join me as we get up close and personal with some of today's most compelling personalities. This is one you can't afford to miss. Weeknights at 7 and 11.30 p.m. on NJTV and 12.30 a.m. on 13.